we know we don't have the whole story, but um, we've never had the whole story in the history of physics. Uh, we've had a series of better and better approximations revealing startlingly more and more beautiful and interesting truths. The night sky is a clock. It is a gigantic clock staring you in the face, and it allowed the ancients to calculate when to plant, when to harvest, in other words, their very livelihood depended upon their understanding the motion of the sun and the heavens. Using mathematics, the ancient Greeks provided more detailed information about our dominant celestial neighbors, the sun and moon. Ancient astronomy assumed a concept of the universe proposed by 4th century BC Greek philosopher Aristotle, who imagined the Earth at the center of the universe with the sun, moon, stars, and planets all revolving elegantly around it in perfect crystalline spheres. The idea uh, that you can predict something doesn't mean you understand the fundamental principles behind it. Ptolemy's system did not accurately reveal the universe, but it didn't try. He essentially showed that the positions of the planets could be calculated for any time past or future. Ironically, the champion of a sun-centered universe was a devout church deacon from Frombork, Poland, named Nicholas Copernicus. Copernicus was troubled by Ptolemy's complex heavenly mechanics but he found an elegant solution. When he moved the Earth from the center of the solar system, and replaced it with the sun at the heart of it all. When Copernicus put the planets going around the sun, he discovered that the planet Mercury, which goes around in about three months, automatically fell closest to the sun. And Saturn, the slowest planet, which goes around in about 30 years, automatically fell at the outside edge. Likely afraid of church reprisals, Copernicus withheld publishing his theory until he was on his deathbed in 1543. But his book, Concerning the Revolutions of the Celestial Orbs, paved the way for Johannes Kepler, born in 1571, the champion of observational science. Kepler was the real hero here because he was the one that really came out and trumpeted to the world that the sun has to be the center. Kepler had at his disposal a trove of astronomical data collected through years of staring at the sky. When he chugged through his observations and did the calculations, realized that not only was the sun center of the solar system, but the perfect circles were a figment also. It was uglier philosophically, but it really matched the data. Kepler improved on the Copernican system by hypothesizing that the planets traveled not in perfect circles, but in ellipses around the sun. Kepler's data also pointed to a strange phenomenon he struggled but failed to understand. As planets approach the sun, they speed up. Further away, they slow down. Together, the sun-centered universe and the variable speed of the planets best explain what we see here on Earth. But as one cosmic riddle appeared solved, another remained. Kepler saw that the sun influenced the speed of the planets as they traveled through space. But how?
At the turn of the 17th century, Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei would take the theories of Copernicus and Kepler that the sun was at the center of the solar system and prove them right beyond any shadow of a doubt. He did this with a new technology that would change the course of history. The telescope, in some sense, is the most blasphemous, the most seditious, the most revolutionary, and the most splendorous instrument of science. All of science received the greatest of gifts in this tool that brought distant objects close. Once the idea got out that you could take two lenses, line them up in such a way, put them in a tube, and make a spyglass out of it, that would spread like wildfire around the world, as it did. And so the issue now is not who's got the telescope, but do you now know what to do with it? Galileo improved on the design in 1609 by grinding his own lenses and creating one that could magnify an unprecedented 30 times. And with that telescope, for some reason, he decided to look at the sky as opposed to the incoming ships to the Republic of Venice. And what he saw completely changed the scope of astronomy. Galileo was treated to the clearest, most detailed view of the heavens any person had ever known. Through his telescope, Galileo saw thousands more stars. A moon pocked with craters, satellites circling Jupiter, Saturn with giant ears. Greatest of all, Galileo plainly saw that Venus went through phases like our moon. Clear evidence that Venus orbits the sun. Proof of a sun-centered solar system. What Copernicus had assumed for aesthetic reasons, what Kepler deduced through measurements and mathematics, Galileo proved. Galileo saw. Galileo revealed. The ancients had seen everything that could be possibly seen to the naked eye. It really took a new instrument to get beyond that. The telescope, that was where the breaking point was between the ancients and the moderns. Galileo, a devout Catholic, published his observations in a book called The Starry Messenger in 1610. Surprisingly, the church welcomed Galileo's findings at first. Galileo been a little more careful in his approach, he might have gotten away with it. One famous quotation from Cardinal Baronius, uh, a predecessor, was, the Bible tells us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. Ultimately, Galileo's downfall was not his inability to sway the church to his way of thinking, but rather his attempt at interpreting scripture all by himself, independent of the church. And Galileo quotes the famous uh, Saint Augustine, who said that if you found an interpretation of scripture which seemed to be contradicted by well-established knowledge, then you should reconsider that interpretation of scripture. But the church, concerned with perceived threats to its own power, could not concede biblical interpretation to Galileo. In 1633, after Galileo published a new book championing the sun-centered system, the Pope summoned him to stand trial for heresy. He's forced to give up all his Copernican ideas, which apparently he did nearly in front of the tribunal. Despite his concession, Galileo quietly held fast to his beliefs throughout his final years under house arrest at his villa outside Florence. 
Galileo is the first modern scientist in the sense that he actively engaged in observations with the telescope, he actively proposed theories consistent with the telescope, and he dared, he dared to challenge the orthodoxy of the moment. Shortly before his death in 1642, Galileo inadvertently stumbled over a clue to Kepler's puzzle about the sun's strange influence on planetary motion. It was a clue that would help point future generations toward a theory of the Big Bang. Galileo's last published work dealt with the properties of falling bodies, which he noted always accelerated at the same rate, no matter what their mass. But it would take another genius to connect these two puzzle pieces together in a theory of gravity. Isaac Newton, born in 1643, explained the mechanism by which the planets moved. And not just how planets moved, but how everything moved, from planets to apples. Newton was a towering intellect. It is astonishing what he did. His moment in the history of science is a sharp break in which the power of mathematics is really brought to bear on aspects of the physical universe. He is what set us down this path of using mathematics to describe the universe, showing that math, for some reason, is the language of the cosmos. Kepler observed through his data the attractive effects of the sun. It acted like a giant magnet. Might the planets also be like magnets? Galileo had theorized about the rate of acceleration of falling bodies, and he realized that regardless of their mass, falling objects always fall at the same rate. But years later, Newton had something to add to Kepler and Galileo. The great insight Newton had was to bring Galileo and Kepler together and to realize that the things that make projectiles move and fall on Earth is the same thing that makes the planets go around the sun in the skies. In a sense, the planets are falling toward the sun. Just as Galileo's falling bodies fell towards the Earth. The crux of it all is gravity, the strange action at a distance that holds everything together. Gravity, the attractive force that affects all matter in the universe, gives the universe order. And gravity is described by the science of physics. Newton created physics. He was the person who first saw the fundamental laws. Underneath all of these observations, Newton's laws explained almost everything. Newton postulated the laws of motion, the universal rules of gravity. He begins a new era in science, using observations and mathematics to describe the laws of nature. He could, in fact, show that the rate at which an apple was falling to the Earth was directly related to the way the moon was falling around the Earth, because he understood that the same laws that led to the motion of the planets around the sun led to the motion of the moon around the Earth. Newton's great book, The Principia, revealed that the tides, the velocity of orbiting planets, even the shape of the Earth could be explained through the pull of gravity. Because everything with mass exerts a pulling force on everything else with mass. The moon pulls the oceans, the earth pulls the moon, the sun pulls the earth, and the closer these objects are to each other, the stronger gravity pulls. Newton's Principia is such an engulfing work of genius 